have my permission to die. What is going on my fellow nerds, Operator Otter here, and today what I'd like to discuss is an S tier build that occupies the same pedestal as Bombardier Necro and will no doubt give it a run for its money. This is the Severmancer. It is a hybrid crit and dot based build that utilizes Sever to dish out high crit based damage and Corpse Miasma to melt the stragglers. It is a build that allows the best of players to shine with its high agency and more advanced mechanical interactions. For proficiency this build is a total 8.5 out of 10 with the other current points allocated as seen here. For difficulty to play, this build is a 9 out of 10 due to multiple interactions that are based on decision making in specific scenarios. For difficulty to gear, this build is a 6 out of 10, relatively average. For fun factor, this build is either a 1 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. The reason I say this is due to the skill ceiling of the build. Some people love builds with high skill ceilings, others don't, so this one can be a hit or a miss for you. If you enjoy shadow builds and or builds that have a high skill ceiling, then grab the popcorn, have a seat, and let's talk about it. Before we begin with the guide, I want to emphasize the importance of the mechanics and interactions for this build. For those who skipped the endgame build chapter, because I know where most of you skip to, and think that just putting on the gear, walking into the dungeon, and casting Sever is going to produce results, you're going to have a very unsatisfactory experience with this build. If you want this build to perform for you, it's not as simple as slap on the gear, cast Sever, and poof, it works like my Bombardier build. This has many interactions and synergies that need to be understood if you want results, but I promise you it's consistent and will take Bombardier to the races. As always, I love to open up build guides with the philosophy of the build and here is no exception. For this build, we will once again need to solve the four factors that most necro builds do, being Bone Storm uptime, Essence Management, Flesh Eater uptime, and Grasping Veins uptime. And to not sound like a broken record, here's how we solve those four. You can pause the video if needed. For most shadow-based necro builds, the main hurdle to conquer is Blighted uptime. Blighted is an aspect that when slotted in our amulet gives us 180% multiplier to all of our damage when our Shadow Blight key passive has dealt damage 10 times. To really understand how this functions and why this is a bigger hurdle to get over than you would think, we need to break it all the way down to thoroughly understand how our Shadow Blight key passive works. So let's start there. Shadow Blight states every 10th time an enemy receives shadow damage from you or your minions, Shadow Blight will deal an amount of damage that is scaled off of your shadow damage over time bonus. The scaling portion isn't important here. What is important is clearly understanding that an enemy has to take 10 total sources of shadow damage in order for Shadow Blight to deal its damage. The reason this is important is because of how it functions in tandem with the Blighted Aspect, which states that you gain damage after Shadow Blight has dealt damage 10 times. This means that in order to gain a stack of Blighted, Shadow Blight must deal damage via a target receiving 10 sources of shadow damage, and we have to achieve 10 stacks for Blighted to come online. There is a misconception that Shadow Blight deals damage to any target on the 10th instance of Shadow Damage and that is not how it works. Let's imagine you are able to one-shot any target with Sever and there are 10 targets in front of you. The misconception states that when you hit the first enemy, this counts as one stack of Shadow Blight. And then when you hit the second enemy, that counts as the second stack. And so on and so forth until you hit the 10th target and voila, that's 10 stacks for Shadow Blight. Shadow Blight goes off and now you have one stack of Blighted. No. In order for Shadow Blight to go off, 10 instances of Shadow Damage must be applied to a singular target, and then Shadow Blight will go off. Well, this creates a problem. Because if our damage is high enough to kill any target with one cast of Sever, then we won't ever get Shadow Blight to deal damage, and therefore we don't get any stacks towards our Blighted aspect, and now the most powerful multiplier in a Necro's arsenal is useless. The main way we solve this problem is the utilization of Dots. Dots will deal these ticks of damage over a period of time that don't deal a lot of damage, but they are damaging the target at a fast rate. This means the target won't die from one hit and instead can receive the 10 instances of shadow damage to get our shadow blight to deal damage and therefore stack our blighted aspect up. In this build, we have three sources of dots. Blighted Corpse Explosion, Blight, and our Seneschal with Dust Support. Yes, the Seneschal's Dust Support ability does count towards shadow damage applied to a target because it is coded as a minion. Alright, it's time to math. So break out the pencil and the notepad. Each of these dots deal two ticks worth of damage over a one second period. If a target is hit by Quartz Miasma, a Blight attack, and a Seneschal attack, then we will have six stacks for Shadow Blight in one second. These applications of Shadow Damage can stack, meaning that if on the first second we applied each of these dots to a target, they will receive six stacks towards Shadow Blight over that second. And on the second second, when we apply another instance of each, 
Now the target receives 12 stacks of Tor Shadow Blight per second, which means now they receive a total of 18 stacks of Shadow Blight, and so on and so forth, creating this sort of ramp mechanic to get Blighted Aspect to turn online. Let's refer to my nifty chart here to give a visual of what I'm talking about. From this chart, we define that if every dot application could be applied once per second, then against a single target, it would take 4.5 seconds for the blighted aspect to turn online. But what if we weren't against one target? What if we were against multiple targets? Well, now from this chart, we can see how long it would take for blight to turn online if we were hitting multiple targets under the same parameters of each dot application being cast once per second. From here, we can conclude that the breakpoints for a three second blight added activation is two to three seconds. For a two second blight activation, it takes four to nine targets. And for a one second blighted activation, it takes 10 targets. At 10 targets, we have an 86% uptime on Blighted, but 10 targets is pretty unrealistic. A more practical scenario is 4 to 9 target range, which means that we have a 75% uptime on Blighted, which isn't great, but not terrible. And this is assuming the Seneschal is attacking the targets we need it to be attacking, which is not happening 99% of the time, unless it's a boss. We need Blighted uptime to be at least 80% of the time, so how do we do this? Well, Corpse Explosion has a rather interesting interaction with attack speed. Corpse Explosion is cast at 100% multiplicative value to your base attack speed. With attack speed in your gloves and shield and utilizing Inspiring Leader, your base attack speed is average about 1.4 attacks per second or one attack every 0.7 seconds. But Corpse Explosion dictates you actually have 2.8 attack speed or one Corpse Explosion cast every 0.35 seconds. This means we can ramp up to five Corpse Miasmas via manual cast in the two seconds we dictated. So now we can get five applications of Corpse Explosion dot to hit five targets within this two second time frame after a manual tendrils cast for our kill zone rotation, which will be discussed later in the video. And from our nifty chart, we can conclude that this is sufficient enough blighted stacks to activate our blighted aspect within that two second period. We can utilize this mechanic throughout the dungeon of stutter stepping the blight cast and manual corpse explosions as we move through it to keep our blighted aspect online more than 80% of the time, which means our severs deal an absolutely ludicrous amount of damage, allowing us to one to two shot any elite in our path. From this example, you can see why I said this build has a high skill ceiling with high player agency. But this is only one example of multiple mechanics within this build that allow you to, as the player to turn this build into a blender. For that reason, much of the remainder of this video will be focused on mechanics and skill rotations. But for now, let's get into the build. In the bottom left of the D4 planner, there is a drop down list that will provide each version of the Severmancer as you are putting it together. Let's start with the Severmancer endgame build. We interrupt this program for an important news announcement! Hey fellow nerds, this is the last time I will say this, so final warning. If you just skip to this portion of the video to just go look at the gear and expect results by slapping on the gear and pressing sever, it isn't going to go very well for you, and you're going to feel debated by some wannabe content creator. If you want this build to perform for you, please take the time to backtrack into understanding how Blighted Aspect works, as well as the mechanics and interactions portions of the guide after the build section. Okay, let's get it. For the helm, we will run Shaco. For chest armor, we will run max life, total armor, damage reduction while fortified, and barrier generation with aspect of shielding storm. For gloves, we will run ranks to sever, critical strike chance, attack speed, and intelligence with aspect of grasping veins. For pants, we will run ranks to corpse explosion, maximum life, total armor, and damage reduction while fortified with aspect of disobedience. For boots, we will run movement speed, movement speed after killing an elite, intelligence, and essence cost reduction with the aspect of slaughter. For the main hand, we will run black river. For the amulet, we will run three ranks to gloom, three ranks to corpse skills, intelligence, and movement speed with the blighted aspect. For Ring 1, we will run Ring of Starless Skies. For Ring 2, we will run Ring of the Sacrilegious Soul for the dungeon. And for Ring 3, we will run a Ring with Crit Hit Chance, Lucky Hit Chance, Resource Generation, and Barrier Generation with Aspect of the Conceited for the boss. For the offhand, we will run Lidless. For our skill bar, we will run Sever, Decrepify, Blight, Bonestorm, Corpse Explosion, and Corpse Tendrils. For sacrifices, we will sacrifice Skeletal Warriors Reapers, Skeletal Mages Cold, and Golem Iron. Skill tree can be found in the D4 planner below. So in our Paragon, the first board that we're going to be running is Exhumation. This Corpse Skill Damage is actually one of the few types of damage. Skill Damage will double dip into a Dot, and so this is not 200%, this is actually 400% damage to the Miasma of the Corpse Skill. It also fortifies us and gives us that damage reduction for a total 14% damage reduction, which is really nice for a melee build that gets in the faces of elite enemies. For our second board, we're going to be doing Scent of Death with Amplify. This is going to us a 10% damage multiplier and gives us some more armor and damage to injured enemies. For our third board, we're going to be running Wither with Abyssal, which is another 10% multiplier to our non-physical damage, and everything in this build is non-physical, so that works out well. Our fourth board is going to be Fleshier with Sacrificial. It's going to give us that 10% damage multiplier, but really important what's happening here is it's giving us these bonus 3.8% resistance to all elements. Because we're not sacrificing the defenders anymore, we're actually losing out on 32% all res, and so we actually need to really focus on getting uh, resistance to all elements in this build, and when you have it all pumped out, you can cap out all the resistances, but this is one of the ways that you do it. For our fifth board, we're going to be running Essence in Bone Graft, and the reason being is that Sever can crit, and this is a very powerful crit multiplier, so Sever is going to really benefit from this. In our sixth board, we're going to be running Darkness. Darkness is interesting because it doesn't reduce how much damage you take, rather than actually reduces the amount of damage that enemies deal, which is a separate multiplier 
and the whole how much damage you take calculation. It also gives us 50.8% shadow damage, which doubled its into dots again, so it's 100% damage for the dots. And then for our last board, we're going to be running Scourge. This is going to give us that 10% damage multiplier to anything that's affected by shadow damage over time, which is going to be everything. And then it gives us that shadow damage over time, which double dips as well. So it's a seven glyph board for the Severed Mancer endgame that makes everything hit really hard. For our seasonal construct in slot one, we will run Tempest Governing Stone with Evernight Resource Support and Dust Support. For slot two, we will run Flash of Adrenaline with Genesis Duration Support and Tactical Support. This is the end game build that you see in the background footage, but there is a way to staircase into it. Because I want to spend more time talking about the mechanics and the interactions, I'm going to be quick with each step. In the bottom left hand corner of the D4 planner, you will see each step to building the end game Severmancer in progression, starting with step one. For step one, this is assuming you have Howl from below and Aspect of Grasping Veins to kind of turn the build online. It focuses more on the corpse explosions dealing damage via the plagued corpse explosion from Howl from below because we don't have a way to passively generate blighted stacks at a functional rate. We also don't have a good essence management option without the Black River, Sack, Ring, and Gar Grim Harvest combo. So what we're going to do is we're going to run Iron Maiden, Reap, and Starlight Aspect and Ring 1, which synergize with a Porrent Iron Maiden to buff up our essence generation to cast Sever at a respectable rate. Okay, so let's say that you're actually not level 100 yet and you're wanting to build this build and kind of get there, but you don't know necessarily where to start. You just come here, you go to step one, and then for Paragon, you're just going to click here. You'll open this up, and this is the end game board that we were talking about, right? Well, the cool thing is that we can actually go all the way up here, and this is actually what your board will look like as soon as you turn 50 with the renowned points that you have. You'll have 25 points total. And then you just go to variant two as you level up, and you go to variant three, and then you'll go to variant four and variant five. And so what this does is this prevents the whole thing of like, here's the leveling board. And you're like, cool, but as I'm going through this, I don't necessarily know what's prioritized. Do I put the glyph in here first before I get this? Do I get this first? Do I get this first? Do I get this first? Well, with this, it just goes step by step and you can know what to do. Now, once you're level 99, you're just going to swap over to the Severmancer endgame. Is this build absolutely min-max optimized? No, because it doesn't have glyph swaps in it, but you don't need to min-max when you're leveling up to 100. It just needs to be a Paragon board that functions. It does its job well. It gets us to level 100, which is exactly what this does. All skills, sacrifices, paragon, and construct skills can be found in a D4 planner. For step two, this is assuming you have farmed Vashan and Zir to get Ring of the Sacrilegious Soul and Lidless Wall. With these items, we now auto-cast Corpse Explosion and have permanent Bone Storm. This will be a drastic increase in our power, but because we don't have strong enough Essence Regeneration to perma-spam Sever or Blight, we will still opt into utilizing Plagued Corpse Explosion and not run Blighted Aspect. All skills, gear, paragon, and construct skills can be found in the D4 planner. For step three, this is assuming you have ran Durial and obtained a Black River. With this, our passive essence generation is now strong enough to not need Iron Maiden, Reap, or Starlight Aspect. Our center stall should have resource support upgraded enough to support further essence generation. This means we can now adequately spam Blight and Sever enough to justify utilization of the Blighted Aspect on an amulet, which skyrockets our DPS if played correctly. I will warn you that due to the beginner-friendly nature and effectiveness of Howl from Below in tandem with Black River allowing the auto-cast corpse explosion to be massive and deal a lot of front-loaded damage, it will perform better than using Blighted Corpse Explosions at first. This is the first time I've come across a build where the upgrades actually feel like downgrades at first, and therefore, as you shift into this version of the build, you will feel an initial power loss and want to go back to using Plagued Corpse Explosion. Don't. There are builds that utilize the idea of crit-based Plagued Corpse Explosions much better than Sever does. The reason we run Sever is its synergy with the Blighted aspect. This build takes a lot of practice, but I promise it competes and is a top three Necro build for this season. All skills, gear, paragon, and construct skills can be found in a D4 planner. Step 4 is the endgame Severmancer, which we have already discussed. This is when you have farmed Duriel and Malphus enough to obtain Shaco, Ring of Starless Skies, Evernight, and Genesis. Let's start by talking about Sever. Sever has four instances of damage. It has the initial charge, the first swing, the return charge, and the final swing. The range of Sever is massive and can go as far as you can put the cursor. This is very important to utilize in the dungeon as it will proc your Lidless Wall to spawn another Storm in front of you, increasing not only the efficiency of Aspect of Shielding Storm, but also the ability to upkeep Bone Storm. It allows you to spawn corpses by killing low HP targets to prep a kill zone rotation or a Miasma Corpse Explosion. Now for console players, this is a bit different because the way Blizzard decided to design Sever for console makes it less optimal to play. On console, you cannot cross screen cast Sever. All you can do is aim it, but it will only go to the first target, hit it, and then return, which makes this build, well, pretty bad for console players. So if you're going to be playing this on console, I apologize on behalf of Blizzard's spaghetti design. This interaction with Sever's four instances of damage can deal an immense amount of single target damage if you position yourself correctly. If you stand away from your target and press Sever as seen here, you will get the initial charge, the first swing, and the return charge, but the final swing will not hit your target. If you reposition so that you are right next to your target like this, 
then you can get all four instances of Sever's damage profile to hit one target and deal a ludicrous amount of damage. This mechanic will be utilized during our kill zone rotation in the dungeon and against bosses. Now let's talk about Decrypify. The TLDR, Decrypify everything. Because this build is much more aggressive than Bone Spirit, Blood Surge, or Bone Spirit, you will be running head first into elite packs and mob density, meaning you will take more damage. Decrypify not only reduces the damage that enemies deal, but it also allows your Bone Storm to come off cooldown faster to ensure you always have Bone Storm up. Let's address the elephant in the room, Blight. Blight is truly what allows this build to shine and empowers Sever to do ridiculous things by kickstarting any damage cycle. Blight has a very high base lucky hit chance and that deals initial damage plus an AoE dot effect that deals damage twice per second for 6 seconds for 13 total instances of shadow damage. This means its ability to spawn corpses is very strong. This allows you to spawn corpses on the pack that you are running it to and therefore be able to cast tendrils to start a kill zone rotation. It also allows you to preemptively place a dot stacking effect on a group in front of you without having to wait for a corpse explosion to go off, allowing for higher blighted uptime. It gives a 15% damage multiplier to anything with Within Blight's AoE pool, which is where you want to set up the kill zone rotation anyways. By preemptively placing a shadow dot on targets in front of you, it kickstarts your darkness glyph so the enemies will deal less damage to you as you arrive to kill them. Lastly, it's by far and large the best ability to spam as you engage on a boss. It will stack your blighted stacks faster than sever and spawn a nutty amount of corpses to set up a massive corpse explosion dots during the blighted damage rotation versus bosses and allow Flesh Eater to be up for that boss rotation. This skill is highly overlooked and you should really spend the time to master its utilization to set up your fights against elite packs and bosses. Corpse Explosion is an ability you should not let your Ring of the Sacrilegious Soul do all of the work of casting. As stated previously, you have 100% multiplicative modifier to your base attack speed when casting Corpse Explosion, meaning you can quickly cast multiple Corpse Explosions to set up Melt Zones, stack your Blighted super fast, and stack your Darkness Glyph quickly. We'll talk more about when to utilize manual Corpse Explosions cast during the Kill Zone rotation and boss rotation combos. Corpse Tendrils is another ability you should not let Ring of the Sacrilegious Soul do all of the lifting on. It's important to cast Corpse Tendrils on the right spot for a Kill Zone rotation in tandem with Blight's 15% multiplicative damage modifier. If you let Ring of the Sacrilegious Soul do all the work, you will have less uptime on the aspect of Grasping Veins, which means less crit hit chance, and you won't be able to set up a specific zone you want to decimate your enemies in. In gaming, the concept of stutter stepping isn't new, but it plays a powerful role in the build, so for any new players or those unaware of what stutter stepping is, let's discuss it. Stutter stepping is the concept of moving in between attack animations that allows for positive progression through content without losing DPS. As you attack in a game, there's a period of time that you cannot attack again because you have this attack speed, but you can move in the time that it takes from one attack to the next, meaning you can move through a dungeon while keeping this maximum DPS. The way that you do this is by swapping between attacking and moving. Let me demonstrate. So here I'm going to give myself 5 seconds worth of time to deal damage as it's how long long it takes to kill an elite target. In this first example, I'll run up to the group first and then I'll start attacking and we will count how many sever casts I can get off. From here you can see I get 7 casts off in 5 seconds. Now what we'll do is attack, then move, then attack, then move up to the target and then once I'm at the target I'll just cast pure sever to see how many attacks I can get off within 5 seconds. As you can see, I still get to the target within 5 seconds but I was able to get off 12 attacks, meaning I haven't lost any speed via movement in the dungeon but I gained 71% more total DPS output. This is important to perform for this build as it will allow for better bone storm uptime with Lidless and have better uptime on bone storm cast because we have more attacks in the same period of time to proc our abhorrent decrepify. It allows us to keep our blighted aspect more often. Lastly, it allows us to preemptively set up a kill zone rotation against elite packs. This isn't a combo more than it's a skill concept with the decision of choosing between Sever into Corpse Explosion or Blight into Tendrils as you move through the dungeon. As you move through it, we are obviously casting Decrepify on everything, but then comes the choice of either doing Sever into Corpse Explosion or Blight into Tendril. The TLDR. If it isn't an Elite, you're going to cast Sever, then manually cast Corpse Explosion. This is the best way to upkeep Blighted Aspect and to continuously one-tap everything with Sever. If it's an Elite group, we want to cast Blight twice into our Corpse Tendrils for a kill zone rotation. As you move through the dungeon and come across an elite pack, perform the following combo. Cast a Crepify on targets. Cast Blight two times on the elites. Cast Tendrils on the Blight AoE location. Spam Corpse Explosion on the Blight AoE location until Tendrils pull. Cast Sever, Profit. This is your bread and butter combo versus elites, and your Sever will one-tap elite groups if it's performed correctly. For our boss rotation, we are going to swap to Ring 3 with Conceited Aspect over Ring of the Sacrilegious Soul and perform the following combo. Decrepify the boss. Spam Blight until 5 stacks of Blighted. Cast Bone Storm. Cast Tendrils. Cast Corpse Explosion 2 times. Cast Blight. Rip Sever into the boss. That boy is dead AF.
That's all I have for you today. Remember, this build takes practice and patience to see how good it really is. And more than likely, it will be the build that I am going to be running for Gauntlet if they even decide to release it in Season 3. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a like. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, let me know in the comments below. I love talking with each and every one of you wonderful people. If you want notifications on future content or when I will be going live on stream, hit that subscribe button and follow me on Twitch. Link in the description below. Good luck and good hunting all. Operator Otter, out.